Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. In this video, we will talk about a very common non-carious dental condition and that is tooth wear. I'm sure you must have noticed some degree of tooth wear in the older patients, but did you know that it is becoming a very common cause of complaint even in the younger population? Watch this video to know everything about tooth wear, the causes, the different forms, how to prevent it and the management protocol to be followed. So to begin with, let us see what tooth wear actually means. Now, tooth wear is medically called as non-carious lesions. It is a gradual loss of tooth substance due to repetitive physical contacts or chemical dissolution. And as the name suggests, it does not have any bacterial or carious involvement. Tooth wear can be categorized as physiological and pathological. Physiological tooth wear is a loss of tooth structure associated with aging and there is no pathology or any specific cause associated with it. But once the amount of tooth wear becomes so severe that it compromises the health of a tooth and the patient starts experiencing symptoms, this tooth wear can be then considered to be pathological. These are some of the different forms that tooth wear presents itself in. I'm sure you all have seen patients in your practice with lesions of these kinds. So what should be our protocol to manage tooth wear? Let us discuss. So, there are essentially four forms or types of tooth wear that we encounter frequently. These are attrition, abrasion, abstraction and erosion. In this video, I am going to focus only on the latter three because attrition is a different ball game altogether and it is much more complicated. So I will make another video for that specifically. Here we will be discussing the other three major forms of tooth wear that is abrasion, abstraction and erosion also known as non carious cervical lesions. But before we get into the details, what is the first thing that you need to do when you have a patient with a complaint of these lesions? Step 1 is to identify the problem and the cause for such lesions because that will eventually determine your treatment plan. So how do you go about that? First is a detailed medical history of the patient. So your job as a dentist is to rule out any digestive issues like anorexia, bulimia, gastric regurgitation. Certain medications like vitamin C tablets are also responsible for erosion. So ask your patients for a detailed medical history. The next essential thing to do is ask your patient about their diet history. Excessive consumption of citrus foods, carbonated drinks, vinegar, etc. All these food products are acidic and are common cause of erosion. And that is why, because of excessive consumption of carbonated drinks these days, erosion has become a very common issue among the young. So, a diet history is also very essential. You must also question about parafunctional habits like clenching, grinding, brushing habit. Ask them about the type of toothbrush, toothpaste, the brushing technique, etc. Once you confirm the medical history, the diet and the habits, move on to the clinical examination. Here you check for any indicators of defective occlusion like tooth mobility, tilted or drifted teeth, occlusal wear, over erupted teeth, any form of malocclusion like crossfight, deep bite, all these are contributing factors for non carious lesions. You can also take radiographs to confirm any occlusal disturbances. So follow this protocol for all your patients. Moving on, we will now discuss the individual lesions. First being abrasion. So abrasion is a result of friction between a tooth and an external agent. The most common cause of abrasion, as you all are aware of, is improper brushing technique, which can involve overzealous tooth brushing, faulty or rigorous tooth brushing habits, use of abrasive toothpaste, hard bristle brush, or improper use of dental floss and toothpicks. You should also be aware of the term called as masticatory abrasion. If the tooth wear occurs on the occlusal and incisal surface due to friction from the food we eat, for example granola, nuts, all bran cereal, that is termed as masticatory abrasion. It can also occur on the facial and lingual aspect of the teeth as coarse food is forced against these surfaces by the tongue, lips and cheek during mastication. The signs and symptoms of dental abrasion include rounded V-shaped notches on the cervical region which are usually worn out, polished and shiny surfaces. If the lesion is restricted to the enamel, it may not be painful. However, if it is untreated, it can lead to dentine exposure which will result in dentinal hypersensitivity. In severe cases, you may even find pulpal exposure but it is not as frequent. Management of abrasion includes first and foremost treating the cause. So educate the patient about the correct brushing technique and dietary habits. You may need to apply a desensitizing agent if the patient complains of hypersensitivity. Restore the tooth if needed. 
Next, we will see what tooth erosion is all about. The term erosion is used to define the loss of dental hard tissues by chemical action not involving bacteria. In simple terms, teeth dissolve in an acidic environment. The correct scientific term is corrosion, but most of us dentists have learned it as erosion. What are the causes of erosion? There are two main sources of acid in the mouth. Extrinsic, this means it comes from the outside. So this is the acid that we put in our mouth. It has been reported that any food substance with a critical pH value of less than 5.5 can become a corrodent and demineralize the teeth. This may occur as a result of consuming highly acidic food and beverages such as citrus fruits, carbonated soft drinks, and sucking on sour candies. Carbonated soft drinks have become a major component of many diets, particularly among the young. And because of that reason, tooth wear is becoming increasingly common in the younger population in the form of dental erosion. And this is something that should not be overlooked. The intrinsic causes of erosion are the acid we generate primarily regurgitated from the stomach like in case of bulimia, GERD or chronic vomiting. Coming to the signs and symptoms, this is what dental erosion looks like. The enamel appears thin and translucent. Enamel is lost on the posterior occlusal or anterior palatal or labial surfaces and the exposed dentine exhibits a concave surface with a peripheral white enamel line or rim. The depressions are mostly seen at the cervical areas of upper anterior teeth. In the posterior teeth surfaces, cupped or invaginated areas develop where dentine is exposed. One very important thing that you need to know is that under the enamel is a softer dentine which is about 10 times easier to dissolve. So many people who come to see me describe how they have noticed the teeth slowly wearing away for years but for the last few years the wear has dramatically increased. This describes what happens when the outer enamel layer is finally lost and large amount of dentine is exposed and when that happens the exposed dentine wears off at a much faster rate. When it comes to erosion, the success of the treatment depends on the patient's cooperation. When derived from eating disorders like bulimia or gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERT, the treatment may require the participation of a physician. Moving on, we have abfraction. Now this is something that is often confused with abrasion. So theoretically, abfraction occurs due to excessive non-axial occlusal forces which results in flexion and stress concentration in the vulnerable cervical region of teeth. In simple terms, any deflective occlusal contacts induces stress on the teeth and if these forces are concentrated on a single tooth, this cervical area gives way as it is the weakest link. This leads to appearance of cracks in the enamel and dentine followed by the destruction of the remaining dental structure. Now this is what we have learnt all these years, right? About a fraction that it is caused due to improper occlusal forces but there is a huge controversy around it. Initially, Tensile stress from malocclusion and masticatory forces were proposed as a primary factor for abfractions, correct? But this theory has no clinical evidence. And when it comes to the current evidence that we have, it is suggested that abfraction has a multifactorial etiology. So it is a result of synergistic effect from abrasion, erosion and occlusal stress. So for a correct diagnosis of abfraction, you need to have a proper medical history which involves anything which results in erosion proper diet history, habits which involve any parafunctional activities like uh, clenching or bruxism and clinical examination to rule out any occlusal discrepancies. Coming to the signs and symptoms, so abfraction lesions are primarily present on the buccal or the labial surfaces of the teeth. They are wedge-shaped or V-shaped lesions with sharp and clearly defined internal and external angles. Management depends on the extent of the lesion. When we suspect abfraction, our first instinct is occlusal adjustment. I would suggest to avoid that because any inappropriate adjustments will increase the chances of caries or sensitivity or aggravate the condition. Attempt only if you have a T-scan because that will give you an accurate occlusal analysis. Occlusal splints can be given. There is no evidence really to support the use of occlusal splint for abfraction lesions, but it can be given as a preventive measure. Desensitizing agents can be applied if the patient complains of hypersensitivity and you can restore the tooth if required. Next, I've already mentioned in the previous slide that a fraction due to occlusal stresses is not clinically proven. But this is what we have been learning over the years, right? That if you see these wedge-shaped notches on the teeth, occlusion of the patient is deranged and you need to correct it. Sounds familiar, right? Adding on to that, 
The occlusal adjustments involve altering cusp lines, reducing heavy contacts and, and eliminating the premature contacts. The problem is that while trying to correct or equilibrate the occlusion, you may in fact end up with more damage resulting in dentine hypersensitivity or you may end up initiating tooth wear. Remember that occlusion is a complex science and the treatment requires a lot of understanding of the concept. Yes, there is no evidence for the effectiveness of the procedure, but we can't completely ignore the anecdotal evidence from all these years. And we all know that any lateral forces on the teeth will be detrimental to the whole masticatory system. So I would recommend to be safe with your approach and perform occlusal equilibration only in cases where the interferences are well established and diagnosed. The adjustment must be carried out in order to remove only the interferences, preserving the original point of centric occlusion. Another thing that can be done is the creation of protective canine guidance with composite resin. It is an additive procedure. You are not reducing anything. You are not doing any irreversible treatment. It is conservative since it involves only the application of composite resin on the canine. But it is important to carefully observe the possibility of excessive stress concentrated on this tooth. If you have a T-scan, then you can probably attend an occlusal equilibration because you will have a more accurate representation of the occlusion. Now that we are done with uh, the three individual lesions, I hope now you have a basic understanding of uh, the three different types of lesions. Now we will discuss the management protocol in detail for tooth wear in general. So your management basically depends on the extent of the lesion and the cause. First, you should always start with a preventive strategy, especially when you see a small amount of wear. Even if the patient has come to you with some other chief complaint but you observe some amount of tooth wear, you can try to identify the type of tooth wear and educate the patient of uh, the preventive strategies or uh, alter or eliminate any harmful habits that may end up aggravating these lesions. For managing a case of tooth wear, you need your patient's cooperation as well. You can do your bit by monitoring these lesions with the help of photographs or uh, models and you can compare these photographs and diagnostic casts or models at different intervals over a few months or years to know if the preventive strategy has worked and to notice any changes in the lesion. In some cases, even if the wear is minimum, if it compromises aesthetics and the patient is not very happy with the way it looks, you can always restore the lesion. If the patient has considerable amount of tooth wear, any dentine exposure in the cervical area may result in dentine hypersensitivity. So you can go ahead with dentine desensitization. This is a viable treatment option for those situations where minimal amount of dentine is exposed, that is less than 1 mm. So you, you can prescribe the patient a dentine desensitizing toothpaste like Thermoseal R8, Sensodent KF or Sensodyne Rapid Relief. All these are some of the toothpaste that work well for uh, reducing the hypersensitivity. Basically, anything that contains potassium nitrate or silver nitrate works pretty well. Along with that, you may also apply fluoride varnishes. GC Tooth Mousse is another product that works well. These are things that can be prescribed to the patient. Apart from that, desensitizing agents can be applied directly on the exposed surfaces in the dental clinic like Luma desensitizing agent, Admira Protect by Voco. In some cases, even dentine bonding agent help. So I would suggest to use a combination of both to minimize the hypersensitivity. The next option that we have is the restorative treatment. How do you decide if restorative treatment is necessary? One, when the structural integrity of the tooth is threatened. Two, when there is dentinal hypersensitivity because of dentine exposure. Three, when the patient is not very happy with the aesthetics. And four, because of pulp exposure. When it comes to the choice of restorative material, we can choose between GIC, that is glass ionomer cement, which can be a conventional uh, GIC or a resin modified GIC, or you can go for composites. The only problem that you have with non-cervical carious lesion is isolation. So make sure that there is no moisture contamination. If possible, use a rubber dam to improve the longevity of your restorations. For anterior aesthetic cases, always go for composite restorations instead of GIC. Uh, you can also go for a laminate technique where GIC or resin modified GIC liner is placed and on top of that you have the composite layer. If the tooth wear is very severe and extends to the pulp and the patient complains of pain, you definitely have to go for endodontic therapy or a root canal treatment followed by a full coverage restoration in the form of a crumb. You may also want to consider periodontal therapy in some cases when the non carious cervical lesion is associated with considerable amount of gingival recession. So root coverage procedures using pre-gingival graft or connective tissue grafts can also be included in your treatment protocol. And with this we come to an end. 
I hope this has been an informative session. So if you have a case of non-cervical carious lesion, always remember the first step is to diagnose or identify the cause with appropriate history and then diagnose what type of lesion or what category of tubeware it falls into and then formulate a proper treatment protocol. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to mention them in the comment section below and please like, share and subscribe to my channel and stay tuned for many more interesting topics.